Welcome back. We're talking to the stars today, and it's always nice to speak to a radio pro. And the problem is, though, you see, Kembrush, you'll know all my mistakes. Oh, every single one of them. <laughs> I've, I've, I've done them all myself. <laughs> <laughs> What's it like being you? Because, I mean, you're on the biggest radio station in the country, and you've got this great program where you're able to have a laugh and play music, and you don't have to worry too much about politics, and you get the stars on. It's really a dream format, isn't it? It's the ideal show. I, I love it, and I, it's um, been keeping me alive for the last... 25 years, really. But the thing is, the BBC don't seem to have noticed it's going on most of the time. <laughs> so they, they've left me alone, which is ideal. You know, and it, it's a great freedom. I've been allowed just to, to go my own way within you know, the music policy. But uh, I'm left alone to do what I do. And as long as the audience figures are fine, which they are, then they are happy to, to let me do it. And they've got other things to worry about. So um, I, I'm left <laughs> to my own devices. I did do breakfast for a short time in the 80s. And even when I was starting it, I thought, I don't like this this is not me it's not what i do and as soon as i got the move to 9 30 uh, the the following year i thought that's it this is now this is where i want to be nice big audience nice time of the day to be working i've done a bit of late night broadcasting and i was going to sleep never mind the audience <laughs> so uh, i like to be on in the morning keeping things jolly and going i'm not planning to change it that, that suits me you say breakfast isn't what you do what is it you do 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 you know, if I could define that, then I would have made more money doing it, probably. Um, I, it's a very strange... I don't analyse what I do very much. I'm just a, a guy who sits and yadders away on the radio and plays some good music. Um, the only thing I, I do think is that people can talk too much on the radio, so I keep things uh, tighter, possibly. There'll be plenty of people who say, I talk too much, but I think I, I, I talk a little less than maybe some others. So I think it's if you can say it in 10 words rather than 100, then that's better. And that's what I've tried to do. What you do extremely well is make it sound very easy, as if nothing can go wrong. At what point in your career did you reach the point when you felt totally at home behind the microphone? Do you know, I think I felt that the first day I walked into a studio. Uh, it was like coming home. And uh, I did a an audition for the BBC, and I, I probably wasn't ideal then. But then I did one for British Forces Radio, and when I was sitting there, I thought, "No, I can, I, I can do this. I like this. I know what I'm doing here. I'm in control. I'm confident, and I'm in my element." Uh, and ever since then, I did hospital radio, and I always felt, you know, quite happy. I've never been frightened of radio. I've never had the fear. Uh, the only fear I've had is that I might blurt out something <laughs> that I shouldn't, <laughs> and it happened to me again today. You know, I was just I was doing uh, I was doing Popmaster, and for some reason I just thought <laughs> it was almost a two reds moment. I thought I'm going to swear, you know? <laughs> but, but I didn't. I didn't. I think there was a, a, a combination of words and a question that could have made me use a, a rude word, um, and I thought I'm going to use this on here, and I, but I didn't. And uh, so far I'm, I've not done that. But that's the only sort of slight moments of hesitation I ever have. Otherwise, in a radio studio, I feel that's where I belong. To be honest with you, see, I think the reason I'm not on national radio, I've got a voice that's like a train coming off a motorbike. You've got this amazing instrument. When did this happen? I mean, is it years of smoking or, or how did you create it? Uh, I don't, it sort of happened. I think when I was younger, it wasn't like this as much. Um, I did smoke when I was younger and I, I drank probably more than was entirely healthy for me. And that's maybe had um, an effect on it. Uh, but I always had a, a slight depth of voice. But it, um, as somebody once said, I had no middle to my voice. I had a top and a bass but nothing in the middle. Uh, and I think that's maybe developed over the years. The middle has come in, uh, and the bass has probably got a bit more bassy as, as, as the, the 15 years of smoking. I've, 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 I stopped a long time ago, and I don't drink nearly as much as I used to. So um, I, I think I can keep this going for a few more years now. But it, it, if you, it's, it's got to be natural. You know, if, you, if you're putting on a voice all the time, that sort of thing, then you can't keep that up, you know. And... 25 years of doing the same thing, it has to sound natural, it has to be natural. Uh, and I just sit there and am myself, or a slightly better version of myself than uh, than is normal, just for two and a half hours a day. And it, it, I always feel better at the end of it. That's the strange thing. You know, I don't know what the listeners feel, but I feel better at the end of it. And so why should I want to stop doing that? It's great fun. It's interesting you say that, though. I was with Tony Blackburn not too long ago, and he really does tend to talk a little bit like that in real life. When do you think that happens, that one day they wake up and think that that's okay? 
I don't know. It probably happens before you notice it. You know, what a sensational, you know. You're waking up the morning, what a sensational day. Um, and, uh, I don't know your professional voiceover man. You think, Welcome to my house. You know, sort of but I, I'm sure that people who listen to me say, oh, well, my voice has changed a lot over the years. Uh, and it's happened without my knowing. Uh, I think it does just. Um, but if you try to change, then it's always going to sound a bit false. I think radio is more real than any other medium in a sense that they'll suss you if you're a fake. Yeah, I think that's broadly true. Um, I think I've known a couple of fakes that weren't <laughs> sussed very easily, but by and large, you know, you do get a fair idea of what people are like. Obviously, they're presenting their nicest part to you. Uh, you're not getting the grumpy, sod side of things, but um, you can't really disguise your true nature if you're on for several hours every day, every week. It's going to leak out despite your best efforts. So you might as well just be natural from the start. All right, let's get back to you then. This autobiography is out, and it's an interesting read. Start right at the beginning. What were you like as a child? I had a very happy childhood. I mean, uh, I, when I sat down to write this book, I thought, oh, God, you know, the, what, people like misery memoirs now. You've got to have been beaten mercilessly every night by a cruel stepfather. And that just didn't happen. I had a lovely upbringing, great family, lovely people. My uh, brothers and my sister looked after me. My mother and father looked after me. I had a, a, you know, an unworried childhood. I just enjoyed myself. And uh, similarly, when I, you know, left school, I you know, rumbled around a bit trying to find the job that I wanted, which was in the radio. But it was kind of difficult to do in those days. And I just did bits and bobs. I was an accountant. I washed cars for a while and did this, that and the next thing. But eventually got into the job that I always knew I, I wanted uh, from about the age of 15 onwards, being on the radio. So, uh, you know, the early years... <laughs> You know, they've made me a content person and happy with my lot. So to that extent, they've shaped what's happened to me on air and at work in uh, years after that. But, um, you know, I can't say that I had a, a tough time. I had a, a good upbringing and I'm very grateful for that because it's, it's made me a, a happy person. There have been lows in your life emotionally and with certain things that you've been addicted to. Has there been stuff written which isn't true? Because I'm always wary of how they write up interviews in the papers. Um, yeah, I mean, there was an impression given that I was a hopeless raging alcoholic, which is not strictly <laughs> true. Uh, I did. I used to enjoy a drink, but then so did everybody in the business. Uh, and I mean, I certainly wasn't, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> the worst by a long way. Uh, everybody drank in radio in the 70s and uh, it was just part of growing up um, and I, I you know I had a few moments when I would wake up thinking where am I uh, <laughs> but I don't think a lot of people have that experience so uh, I was never in any sense uh, dangerously <laughs> addicted to anything at all uh, but you know I've also had uh, some marital ups and downs and uh, I've had to you know I felt if you're writing your autobiography you've got to write about these honestly um, you don't have to give every detail because, you know, frankly, it's nobody else's business. But, you know, you've got to say what happened and that's what I, I, I think I've done. But, um, you know, by and large, you know, it's been a fairly straightforward lifestyle and I haven't, uh, I'm not exactly, you know, your rock and roll king <laughs> in terms of misbehaviour. It's interesting though, because if you look back to the 70s and 80s, I mean, they were the showbiz years of radio when you were the megastars. How hedonistic was it? How much fun was it? How easy was it for Ken Bruce to get the busty blondes? Uh, I never got the busty blondes, I have to tell you. I was always um, either married or about to remarry, so it, was, uh, <laughs> it didn't happen. Uh, no, I mean, it, it sounds like a much more exciting time, but I can tell you it wasn't terribly. It was just uh, a bit of boozing and, um, you know, a few late nights, uh, in my terms anyway, and I was in... Glasgow in the 60s, so I missed the swing in the 60s because they happened in London, never got to Glasgow. <laughs> in the 70s, I was in an accountant's office, so you can tell how exciting that was. And by the late 70s, I was in the BBC in Glasgow and, and I was, I'd worked out what I wanted to do with my life then, so I was just uh, enjoying uh, a fair old amount of beer and uh, being on the radio, and that, that was my life. Is it fun waking up every day and talking to the nation? I mean, it's a great privilege, and there aren't that many shows, that's why everybody seems to want them. How does it feel? Well, you can't look upon it as being, you know, the biggest job of your life or thinking, goodness me, 6.85 million people are listening. You notice how exactly I know the figure. <laughs> um, so, I mean, it, it is important that you think, right, OK, there's a lot of people out there, but you don't think about that when you're doing You think you're just doing the nice little chat to your friend. Uh, you know, you're just sitting there, you're talking to somebody you've known all your life with your arms folded. It's like a telephone call. It's entirely natural. 
uh, more so than television where you've got makeup and your best suit on and you're smiling at the camera all the time this is just you know you're sitting your eyes are closed you're scratching your head whatever uh, it's a natural conversation and that's the way that radio should be i think but it also means that you know i don't treat it as being oh a big showbiz job it's just what i do how do you manage to relax somebody immediately when they come in a room um, I had a long time experience of doing it uh, because when I first started it I was more nervous than they were and so uh, that transmitted itself as well so I thought right it's my job to make them feel at home I'm in my element I shouldn't be nervous about interviewing them because all I would do is ask a few questions uh, and once I decided that then it was fine and so it was just a question of oh, making people feel at home well, come in you know uh, and saying something nice to them because they you forget even the most famous people are insecure and nervous especially if they're doing something they don't normally do uh, and so when somebody comes into an interview in your studio you have to make them feel at home get them a cup of coffee, a glass of water, whatever, make them feel happy and uh, tell them how great they are. Um, it's, it's simple manners, really. It's what you would do if somebody came to your house. It's what you do in a studio. Would you prefer being the interviewer in this interview or are you happy with me asking you the question? Uh, I've got used to being interviewed now, but I would probably rather be the interviewer, although I would feel more responsibility as the interviewer um, because I'd, I'd want to make sure this turned out to be a good piece. So it's all down to you, really. If I'm boring the listeners, it's your fault. I think it is, to be honest. All right, let's do a review. How have I done? What could I do better? Anything I should have asked you that I haven't? Well, do you know, I'm the world's worst instructor in radio. I have no idea <laughs> what works and what doesn't work. All I know is what works for me, and so I do it. I think I've given one piece of advice uh, to another broadcaster in my life, which was slow down. Uh, oh, and I said, and, and don't stress the last three words of every sentence. That was the only thing I was uh, ever able to say. So, uh, no, uh, you're doing fine. You're doing fine. All right, Ken, lovely to talk to you. The new autobiography is in your stores now, and it's a great read. It's a fascinating life, and you're there with us like the uncle every day, that you're just there in the corner. Ken Bruce, thanks for talking to me. Thank you, Alex. Very nice.